Hi, I'm Sudhir Paluri, the CTO of Computational Sciences Experts Group. Today, I talk to Professor Rick Lane. Rick is the Professor of Material Science and Engineering at University of Michigan. He has been working on nanopowders, which are the future for our lithium ion batteries. I talked to him about the history of batteries, where we are today, the challenges, and where the batteries are headed. This interview is part of the technical interview series of nuanced conversations about different automotive technologies. If you have any questions for me or Professor Rick Lane, please leave them in the comments below and we will try to answer these questions in the comments or in the future videos with battery experts. I hope you find this interview just as mind expanding as I did and click subscribe if you want to be notified of the future interviews when they get posted. Thank you for talking to me today. No problem. You have been working on batteries quite a bit recently. Yep. And I want to particularly solid state batteries. And so I want to talk more details about what those are, where we're headed, what they bring to the table. But before we get into solid state batteries, maybe we zoom out and see where we are. So start with the lithium ion batteries that we have today. Just to give us a big picture perspective, can you talk to us about how we came about with lithium? Okay, well, I've seen your list of questions and it begins with NICAD yeah. batteries. Mm -hmm. And they were the first kind of solid state batteries that allowed one to have portable cell phones, okay? Right. Uh, though I've seen portable cell phones with um, the original zinc um, batteries and they were huge. So nickel cad promoted cell phones were much smaller, they were extremely heavy. Mm -hmm. And while nickel cadmium worked, it had two problems. One was that you had to deplete the charge almost completely to recharge it completely or it wouldn't recharge completely. So it had what's called a memory effect. Okay. I remember that. The other issue is that it contains cadmium and cadmium is quite poisonous, toxic, and therefore there are recycle issues that people ignored mm -hmm. because the number of batteries in use is much smaller than what we have today. Okay, so then uh, the next thing that came was uh, nickel hydride batteries and those had higher energy density but they were still heavy okay because mm -hmm. nickel is not uh, quite any different from NICAD and that was supplanted but when people discovered that you could make lithium based batteries where the lithium is really impregnated into graphite mm -hmm. and so you went from a density of say four to five for NICAD to two for lithium and graphite so you're batteries got to be much lighter and you could get essentially the same energy density as you could with an ICAD, but of course it's much easier to handle. And is, the, that, is that double the density? You said four to four and a half down oh, to Oh no, the density is the, the density of the material, right? not the it. energy density. Okay. okay, so nowadays <clears throat> we don't even talk about energy density in ICAD. We begin with lithium ion batteries that are really graphite that has been lithiated have an energy density that's about 370 milliamp hours per gram and that's if they work perfectly which they never do right. okay so that is anybody who's looking for a new battery has to beat that and of course all of you who are out there listening to this recognize that you want to recharge your battery many, many times. Right. And that was something uh, that the NICAD had the memory effect that we talked about, that nickel hydride did not have a memory effect, but you can right now charge your lithium ion batteries hundreds of times, and that means that they last. Okay. However, of course, like everything, mm -hmm. they slowly die. Right. So the question is always something that people don't normally recognize it's called cost of ownership. Mm -hmm. How long can you use the same battery before it has to be replaced? Nowadays, our motivation to replace a battery is not actually the battery, but the quality of the apparatus that it powers is improving at a rate that you trade in your smartphone every year or two years. 
depending on how obsessive you are, mm -hmm. to get a new phone with better camera, with higher memory, all of these things, and that operates faster, witness 5G. So and everybody uses wants more battery power and as well. uses more battery power and is easy to charge and can be charged without plugging it in. So all of these things are parts of the cost of ownership. And there's another one, which is how cool can I look with the latest phone? Mm. Okay, so that's uh, something separate from what we need to think about in terms of a real battery. So all of you have seen lithium ion battery fires. Mm -hmm. Okay, they're always amazing because there's parts of the lithium ion battery that need a liquid electrolyte. So the principle by which batteries work is you have one component that loves to give up electrons and mm -hmm. another one that loves to accept electrons. And so the one that gives up electrons, you use it to source the energy that you power your device with. Right. And then the one that accepts it is the one that you store, in this case, lithium, until you charge it and then you reverse the process. All of this occurs with heat, okay? Because the movement of the lithium from one side to the other does mm -hmm. not occur free from what we call impedance. It means that your, you have the pathway for lithium movement is interfered with by, among other things, in the case of liquid electrolytes, which is what catches fire for the most part. Mm -hmm. The lithium that comes out of the graphite has to attract solvent molecules, and then it travels through the solvent to the other side, to the cathode, where it must give up those solvent molecules to be intercalated into the cathode material. The solvation and desolvation generate heat. And of course, the design of the ions that move with the lithium, so mm -hmm. the counter ions, that also is a problem because in liquid electrolytes, when you charge, you're also moving the counter ion the other direction. And so you end up creating a capacitive effect that defeats the charging and uses more energy. Yeah. So let me ask uh, a clarifying question. So is this worse in, with lithium ion compared to how it was with NICAT? So by moving to lithium ion, has the resistance or the impedance gone up and the heat? The heat issue is still there because you still have to change the structure of the anode and the cathode. Right. They, so they change, once it's depleted, the structure changes a little bit or a lot. And that's also involved in generating heat. So there is some difference, but I think that it's probably not worth going back and finding out why NICAD doesn't work. It doesn't work nearly as well. Right. Okay. Yeah, agree. So let's talk about solid state batteries. You've been working on solid state quite a bit recently. And let's start with why solid state batteries over the current batteries? Okay. So I think there's several reasons. It's the flaws with the liquid electrolyte that mm -hmm. drive us to find ways to escape them. So one of the reasons why lithium ion batteries fail now is that as you charge, the lithium has to go back into the anode as lithium, and we can call it lithium metal, it really isn't, but it's encapsulated in your anode, okay. in the graphite in this case. Mm -hmm. And when it goes back, it has to go back uniformly. Okay. All right, so you'd like it to fill in all of the spaces it left, but it doesn't. Mm -hmm. It sometimes just says, I'm happy right out here in the front, and I'm going to just stay here, and you end up plating lithium mm -hmm. where it doesn't want to be, okay. or rather it wants to be there, you don't want it to be there. Right. And as a consequence, you are facing the fact that the lithium doesn't plate flat. It plates where there's the highest potential. So it just comes out and then some more lithium comes out on that spot and more, and it grows a spike or a dendrite. And that spike or dendrite now goes back towards the cathode and it short circuits. And of course the short ah. circuit leads to heating, leads to either catastrophic or just thermal runaway, which leads to destructive uh, behavior. How, how common is that? So I, I have a one year uh, old electric vehicle, bought it in 2020. Do you think there are some areas in the battery that have little dendrites or does it take a while? Yes, some of them have, but it, when you discharge, you can deplete the, the dendrites to some extent so they go away. Got it. So 
one of our solid state battery systems, which I'm not going to tell you what it is, the, we know we must form lithium dendrites, but we also know that they actually react first so that they dissolve. Got it. Okay. So they are probably is that in most systems. Okay. But the question is, sometimes the lithium gets coated and then it gets lost. You can't use that capacity. So eventually the battery dies. That's only one of the mechanisms for losing lithium. Okay. Right. All right. So the liquid, so that's short circuiting, which leads to catastrophic failure. There's another issue, which is that the liquid electrolyte itself can degrade to some extent. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the degradation leads to gases and the gases can eventually break seals. And when they do, you can expose the lithium to air mm -hmm. and you can have a fire. Okay. And it, lithium is not so flammable if it's a plate of lithium. However, a very fine needle is very, very susceptible to oxidation. So mm -hmm. you can get, again, you get fires. Okay. And of course, the liquid electrolyte itself is flammable. So it can also catch fire. There's a, a story of a guy who bit his cell phone with his teeth and caused a fire. Wow. So okay. as soon as it gets exposed to air and it can. humidity, it can. It can, yes. So a little bit of history. Actually, this is kind of hidden. If you go look in the literature, the very first lithium-ion batteries were sold by Panasonic. I think that's correct. And yet the very first lithium-ion battery company was in Canada near Vancouver called Molly E. Mm -hmm. And they were the first to actually develop lithium ion batteries. There they were working with lithium metal sheets in a very dry atmosphere and it was working reasonably well. And then somehow they had a fire and that's when they were, their technology, their IP was bought up and that's where Panasonic took over. Uh -huh. And there's a name involved in that first company and we'll leave that alone for a moment. Right. Okay. And people who want to look it up can look it up. And I'm yeah. sure it's well, it's actually a little bit hard to find. I had to go searching because I know the, I actually went to the original place where they were producing it for reasons that um, aren't important at the moment, but uh, right. I so, got to visit it. So, so that, that makes a, um, a lot of sense that if it is so flammable that you would want to try to keep oxygen out of it, how, how come we ended up picking an, an electrolyte or a medium that allows for easy oxidation or easy puncture? All right. All right. Well, that's a good question. All right. So the, the reason you choose certain electrolytes is they have to be very polar like water, but not water, mm -hmm. so that they can dissolve the lithium salts that travel back and forth. And of course, the higher the concentration of lithium salts or lithium ions in solution, mm -hmm. the higher, the, the more rapid you can discharge or charge the battery. So the liquid electrolytes are often oxygenates. And so they have oxygen present. It's also true that, remember I said in the beginning that you have an anode material that loves to give up electrons and you have a cathode material that loves to soak up electrons and also will pick up lithium, that's usually an oxygenated metal. Right. And so that those metals at very high potential will actually generate oxygen to some extent. And that oxygen can also cause decomposition and of course the explosive decomposition. Got it. So we have to envision how to reduce those problems. One of them would be to make a solid that allows the lithium ions to move back and forth, but doesn't catch fire. And you have to imagine if it's in a liquid, then the, the lithium can move fast, but a solid, the lithium can't move fast unless you happen to have tunnels for it to move. So that is the basis for making what we call solid electrolytes that now separate the anode from the cathode. So at the moment, all of us have lithium ion batteries where there is a separator, but the separator is a polymer. And the polymer is something like polypropylene and it's got very tiny holes in it mm -hmm. so that you have liquid and the lithium can go back and forth through that, those holes, but you don't get contact between the anode and the cathode, which of course leads to short, short circuit, which leads to catastrophic failure. But you still have a problem because the polymer is still quite susceptible to dendrite penetration and short circuiting. Got so it. that now pushes us towards 
making solid state batteries. However, all of the problems that I mentioned previously become multiplied because you have now lithium that has to leave the anode and it has to go into the solid electrolyte. So it changes from being surrounded by graphite to being surrounded by something else. Mm -hmm. And it has to be comfortable in that electrolyte. That's a solid electrolyte. And it has to diffuse rapidly through. Otherwise, you don't have a useful system. And then it has to exit the solid electrolyte and into the cathode. And so it has to go across an interface. So we're faced with those interfaces turn out to be the problems with getting matching of the energetics. So there's always heat buildup as the lithium goes across the interface because there's resistance to that transfer. Got it. it uh, are they the primary cause for the resistance in the battery? Well, there's a combination of the lithium ions moving across interfaces. And you could say that's a good deal of it, but lithium percolation out of the anode and into the cathode and mm -hmm. vice versa also cause heating because there are some structural changes as lithium exits or enters. And those also can be, they cannot, they uh, should be reversible 500 times, for example, but they aren't necessarily because there are always flaws that occur in the manufacture of the electrode, so the anode or the cathode, mm -hmm. and those flaws can propagate and make things worse with time. We would love to have things that never change. There are some materials that don't change hardly at all, and those are, of course, very, very well-researched and exciting, and people are want to have a, a, a... All of you recognize you would like to charge your, your cell phone or your electric vehicle in five minutes. Yeah. Anybody who says they can do that, don't believe them. Okay. Could we technically get there? I know we're jumping the gun. There are materials that work, mm -hmm. but they have to be, there are interface issues that have to be resolved. Okay. Again, the interface is everything. How do you design an interface mm -hmm. so that the mobility of the lithium ion back and forth is minim minimal in terms of the amount of energy it gets used up as heat as it moves from here to there? And so we're looking at interfaces that allow the ions to move very quickly without causing a huge amount of resistance. Exactly. Got it. So there's people have gone and searched for ceramics that allow lithium ions to move freely. And basically what people have done, and, and you have to recognize that there's a huge investment in many years finding the right materials. This is not trivial. And as a consequence, people are always looking for new solutions. What they do is they, they take something that looks okay, never be useful commercially, and then they dope it with different ions. Mm -hmm. And what they're doing is changing the size of the tunnels that allow lithium to move. Okay. They're basically tweaking them. They want the tunnels to be a certain size so the lithium will move, but the lithium will not be blocked from moving. Okay. Right. And the, and remember that the lithium has to move by binding to oxygens so that there's got to be an electrostatic interaction with the oxygens or with sulfur. Okay. Mm -hmm. Or with nitrogen. Those create different electrostatic environments. Those environments control the lithium ion movement in a way that if you know how to design them, this is something called crystal chemistry. Okay. You can design certain structures and they move better and they, the, the volume of the, or the, the diameter of the hole is what determines how well they, they move and of course the number of oxygens that line the hole or the number of sulfurs, okay? And by the way, you may have seen in the literature that, that uh, Solid Power in Colorado just had an investment of I think it's $130 million and they make sulfur-based materials. And they have materials that are easily processed. One thing I didn't mention is that if you use a ceramic electrolyte that's an oxide, you basically have to make particles that you then sinter to make them fully dense and control the tunnels, which really means you control the crystal structure of the material you form. Those processes often take high temperatures of a thousand degrees or even higher mm -hmm. to get the right structures, to get the right lithium contents. 
And as a consequence, they are problematic from commercialization when you have to make thousands of square meters of solid electrolyte, you can envision how difficult it is to center at a thousand degrees centigrade. Okay. Got it. All right. But I want you all to think about this. All of you probably own a vehicle that has a catalytic converter. Mm -hmm. Catalytic converters have ceramic monoliths that contain the catalyst. They are centered in ovens where the catalytic converters are loaded onto a rail car and shoved into the furnace and heated to 2000 degrees and centered and then they're all going to automobiles. So you can envision that if somebody can do that for automobiles, they can do that for cells. Okay. Right. So it's possible, it's just expensive. So I mentioned solid power a moment ago. Solid power uses sulfur-based electrolytes and sulfur-based electrolytes are soft and they can be pressed and so that means you apply mechanical properties, mechanical pressure rather, right. to densify them. And they offer tunnels that are equal to what you can get with oxides, but less energy involved in their assembly. However, there is a side issue. When you make metal sulfides, the end of life is a problem. Metal sulfides such as used in lithium, well, in, in sulfur-based electrolytes, mm -hmm. on exposure to water, give off H2S. H2S is more toxic than hydrogen cyanide, which is used in the gas chamber to kill people. Okay, so you need to think about how to recycle this material such that you don't expose anybody working with it, or if there's accidental failure of a cell phone or a computer or, gosh, an electric vehicle that people standing around watching the fire don't get poisoned by the gases that go off. So these are issues that people don't think about yet. Right. So it seems like the limiting factor in some cases is the manufacturing ability at mass scale and isn't necessarily material specific research. Well, yes and no. There's, there's Yes, it's true that you're always going to have, in order to densify, you have to heat the materials up to have all of the elements move and form thin films. Mm -hmm. I might add that even if you do, one of the ideas of using these thin solid state ceramic electrolytes is that they're strong enough to block dendrite propagation. Okay. That was the idea, except for in the last four or five years, people have found that the lithium grows along the grains and goes through the ceramic because mm -hmm. it happens to be amenable to where the lithium likes to go. So in fact, they also short circuit. Not as fast, but you don't want it to short circuit at all, so. Right, but you also said that the short circuiting was reversible when during the charging. Oh, uh, I said that process. in some instances it's okay. reversible, okay. In fact, when it is reversible, the only thing you don't, you don't use the lithium efficient, efficiently, but you may won't be able to live with that if it's just a small amount. Got it. Does it delay the process? So instead of uh, um, things going bad in four years, if it's 15 years, we say, well, that's uh -huh. okay. Cost of ownership. Uh -huh. So the answer is that I don't think enough people know yet. Okay. All right. We certainly don't know. We have our first example where the lithium, we pretty sure it grows and then goes away, but we don't know anything about it because we just discovered it works. Got it. Okay. So you have been working on uh, solid electrolyte and I saw a really cool video showing the process with which your lab deposits this, this solid electrolyte. Can you talk a little bit about what it is and what okay. you're trying to achieve and, and why pick that process over <laughs> the other? That, that's a, a lovely question to answer. So we developed a process for making nanopowders, okay? But there's a phrase that all of you are familiar with. If you have a hammer, mm -hmm. everything looks like a nail. Right. And so we were looking, we made a, a process that makes nanopowders very easily. If you've ever taken a hairspray can and put it into a cigarette lighter, you make a blowtorch, right? So long ago as a teenager, I did do that. But more recently, I realized if I dissolve something in alcohol, and I use a perfume mister, I can actually put this through a flame and make nanopowders of any composition 
that you like within reason. And so that's how we got started. And then we looked for what to, where to use our hammer. And we found with um, one of my former postdocs called me up one day and said, <clears throat> can you make some thin films? I have some money for making ceramic electrolytes. Okay. And so he did and we did. And it worked better than we could expect. And so we ended up making, because you have nanopowders, the nanopowders are very, have very high surface areas. And when you have high surface areas, the surfaces are all of higher in energy than a bulk ceramic. So now when you heat them up, the surfaces provide the energy for densification that you don't have with larger particle sizes. And so we were able to densify at much lower temperatures than traditional. And because we start with finer powders, we could make dense, thin films that were flexible. Right. And that is another issue. And many of you may remember that there was a period in time where iPhones would bend and then they would fail because they bent. So imagine that if you make a ceramic electrolyte that is flexible, the chances of failure are much less. And that was highly desirable. Of course, the thinner the film, then the faster the lithium can move back and forth through it. And in addition, it costs less because you use less. And furthermore, that means that the ceramic film isn't taking up volume that you could use to have lithium anode materials or cathode materials. So the energy density of a solid state battery would be higher. Got it. So I am imagining, as you're describing a process, sort of a spray paint kind of a thing. Yeah. Except that there is a flame in the middle, of course, yeah, it's a blowtorch. Yes. Yeah. Right. But you're depositing a thin layer. We're making the nanopowder. Right. You can do that. what you say. The problem is the following. The flame is at a thousand degrees or higher centigrade, mm -hmm. and you can't put it on anything and collect the powder except for something that precipitates the powder like a vacuum cleaner. Right. Okay. So mm -hmm. you can't really, you could deposit it as your substrate was going to be resistant to high temperature. So it's easier to do this separately. Is there, is there another simpler way to deposit these powders besides a high temperature flame? I mean, I'm thinking, well, the, mm -hmm. the automotive painting process yes. that dips it into a liquid. Well, or... you can do electrostatic deposition, but yeah. you still have to densify it. Okay. So if you did, if you, could you, you explain that a bit more? Sure. All right, I can powder coat and I can, pow I can paint anything the way they do in the automobile industry. Right. But they remember that the, once a car has been painted, it has to be baked. Right. Okay, it goes through an oven with hot lights and whatever. But we still have to bake ours, but it has to be 1,000 degrees. Of, let's say maybe 900, okay? okay? So you can't do that on the, on the car body. Got it. You have to, so you can do it on something that you can remove the thin film from. Okay. Okay, and then you can use it in your battery. There is a, a problem with that, which is one that I alluded to, and that is that I have to make sure that my interfaces are perfect. Yeah. So one of the things that we have developed, which I, f I find kind of fun, is that you can make very flat ceramic thin films. People do that all the time, but you imagine you want to make a solid state battery. So I have to have a anode that's flat surface, a cathode that's flat surface, and then I have to make them with my ceramic electrolyte flat surface. I am asking a lot of the interface to be perfectly mated. Not likely. Right. Okay, so I now need something that I can basically glue both sides to. So one of the things that got me started in making nanopowders was that we made, it's already 25 years ago, we made polymers that when heated turn into ceramics. So we have now made basically a ceramic adhesive. You paint it on like a polymer and then you make your peanut butter sandwich, okay, and then right. you heat it up, okay, or melted cheese sandwich might be better. Right. And then you sandwich it and then you warm it up and then it the, the glue turns into the ceramic electrolyte. Got it. Okay, so we can, in fact, use those themselves as the ceramic electrolyte. So okay. we're experimenting with that now. Okay. So, so essentially, you're you're putting it on and then baking it at 900 or 1,000 degrees centigrade as opposed to using a blowtorch. Oh, yeah. You, no, the blowtorch is to make the nanopowders that you can then form into a thin film. Got it. Okay. Why must it be a nanopowder? Why? Because we'll revisit this. 
the, the nano size has very high surface energy because atoms at the surface of a nanoparticle are unhappy. They're at higher energy because they're not sitting in a perfect crystalline system in the interior of the particle. Yeah. And so they are at higher energy and they want to move to be in a more perfect crystalline environment. So they do when you heat them. Okay. All right. So that drives them to consolidate. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Got it. And so as the battery is then be, is being used, does the crystal structures change? That's, I kind of address that, but obliquely. As you use your battery, the, in the case of a graphite system, the lithium leaves the graphite yeah. and it goes to the, the cathode material where it in, intercalates into the structure of the cathode material. The dendrites you're talking about. No, it's just lithium ions move from right. left to right mm -hmm. and they have to be stored somewhere as you do work with the battery. Right. So the storage and the loss of lithium can cause, so the lithium goes into the graphite. Graphite's layered, right? When mm -hmm. the lithium goes in, the, it, it, the graphite expands a little bit. So this volume change is not a lot, mm -hmm. but it's enough that the structure comes, goes back and forth as you charge. Yeah. This may or may not lead to eventual failure because it, of imperfections that either were there Mm -hmm. Or you're creating because, for example, the liquid electrolyte degrades the surface a little bit. Okay. Got it. And I haven't even talked about the degradation at the surface because that's another story. And so this is same is true of the cathode material. The lithium goes in. The cathode material may expand and then contract as you charge it and reverse it. And those changes can change the structure slowly. Or rapidly. Obviously, if it was rapidly, we wouldn't use it in a battery. Right. Okay, so these, this is again, I mentioned thousands of man years have gone into finding the right materials and doping them to get the right properties, and they're still not solved because there's always somebody finding another way to do something. Right, this is great. So please do talk about the surface structure change that you were alluding to a, a, a minute ago. How okay. big of an issue is it? That's, really? that's a very serious issue. Okay. So you heard us discuss interfaces and mm -hmm. where all of the heat is lost because of resistance or impedance. And so an interface must be designed so that that's minimized. However, there's no such thing as zero interface problems. So what happens is that you usually do a break-in of a battery our idea of break-in means that you age it mm -hmm. to develop what's called a solid electrolyte interface, SEI. Mm -hmm. And if you can make that stable, then that is what controls the heat loss each time you cycle. Okay. Okay. So the solid electrolyte interface on graphite forms an oxygenated material. And on the cathode, there are many things that can go on. I won't address all of those, but... You want them to stay stable as you cycle. Sometimes you get the liquids to degrade with time. Mm -hmm. The liquid electrolyte degrades with time. And then that solid electrolyte interface, the SEI, gets bigger. When it gets bigger, the impedance goes up, the resistance goes up, and now the battery loses capacity because it can't cycle lithium. It can't let lithium go or pick up lithium faster. So the design of interfaces is really big business. Mm -hmm. There's all sorts of really exotic things that people do, and they do it because if you can fix it before you get further in, then you solve a problem and the battery lasts longer. And even if it costs twice as much, remember that if it lasts five years instead of one year, you win. Right. Okay, even if it costs twice as much. Is the interface also the secret to faster charging? It can be if you are looking longer term. If the SEIs, solid electrode interface, doesn't change, then you can maintain the charging. It may also prevent, for example, defects from forming in the anode or the cathode or propagating. So the answer is, in a sense, it is longevity. It isn't necessarily making it better. Got it. 
also longevity in the capacity of the battery. Yes, itself. that's but, what I implied. Sorry. Right. Okay. In uh, in some of your writings on on this, you had talked about better conduction as well. Is that that's um, lithium ion movement? Correct. Okay. So one thing I did not mention, but I should because it's a good time to do that. When you have a liquid electrolyte, I mentioned the fact that you have to have lithium and a, it's a lithium salt. So the, you, you all know what sodium chloride is, it's table salt, right? So you have right. sodium and chlorine, the chlorine is the counter ion. In a liquid electrolyte with the lithium ion, you have to have a counter ion. That also moves when you apply potential. So you are always, when you're charging or discharging, the counter ion is also moving and you don't get any energy from it. Right. But you use energy in causing it to move, and you use energy, it kind of piles up in one part or another and does nothing for you. And so you don't get anything from it, and you lose energy in the form of heat because you have to move it around. In a solid electrolyte, the lithium ion is the only thing that moves. The oxygen or the sulfur are immobile, and so they don't take up energy, they don't move. And so that's an advantage of a solid electrolyte, or you can also make polymer electrolytes where the counter ion is immobilized in the polymer. And that means that the lithium ion can move and you don't use up energy by moving the counter ion at the same time. That has a big advantage because that means that your, your heating is going down and the resistance is going. And you have to think about this. It may be that the, your cell phone stays nice and cool but right where things are moving, it can get hotter than you would like. The average temperature may be the same, right. but locally it may heat, and that could lead to degradation, which you don't want. Right. Okay. So, so, so engineering interfaces is very big business. Sounds a lot more efficient than lithium ion batteries that you don't have, you're not spending energy to move the other, other ions uh, backward. So that's does that true, mean- true, but you still have, Remember that I need a tunnel that I design, yeah. and the lithium can only crawl through that tunnel at a certain rate. Okay, and, and I can't make, in, in a liquid electrolyte, the lithium goes helter-skelter, and it doesn't matter. But when you have tunnels, you mu must control the number of tunnels. It's, this is um, an analogy, okay? Yeah, it's I not, understand. And so that, that is usually a limiting factor in getting good conductivity. Some materials are better than others. The sulfides tend to be better. Okay, because oxygen electrostatically interacts with lithium much more strongly than sulfur. And as a consequence, lithium moves faster through sulfides than oxides. Fine, except for the downside would be the hydrogen sulfide. Right. Okay. Got it. How much, if we were to quantify the higher conductivity or lower resistance, are we talking... 10%, 5, 10%? Are we talking 50, 60%? Oh, we're talking orders of magnitude. Orders of magnitude. Yes, 10, which, 10 to 100 times. Higher conductivity, yes. which means... So, no, that's the, the liquid electrolytes are usually much higher than okay. the solid electrolytes. So you can, but the difference is, remember I mentioned something called a polymer separator. That's usually 20 microns, yeah. right? But it used to be 50 and 100 microns. Mm -hmm. And then that was the problem was that it had to pass all the way through. Now that they've learned to make thinner, that makes it better and you get higher conductivity. Ceramic electrolytes can always be 20. All right, they can be. Our method makes 20. There's a company in Japan called Ohara mm -hmm. and they make solid electrolytes, but they wafer saw the films. So all of you are familiar with making silicon wafers that they make a big single crystal bool of silicon and they slice it and then they make these wafers that they put they put circuitry on, okay? Yeah. Well, they use the same saw to cut the ceramic that is a electrolyte. So the original thicknesses were 200 microns, which is very, and they were charging $400 for a, for a one, one inch by one inch or four centimeters by four centimeter piece. Now their wafer sawing down, I've heard that they can get to 20 microns. However, I can't imagine that wafer sawing a ceramic is not gonna give them a high yield. Okay, because every time they're cutting, they're cutting away something that is holding that one piece from other, but of course they can recycle it. Right. So the issues still are the thinner the better. There's a solution which is expensive but works. 
there's something that is a, remember I said that you wanted to block dendrites. Mm -hmm. So, and then I said that the dendrites can grow along the grain boundaries. Well, right. there's a ceramic, it's actually a glass, that prevents dendrites from growing and you can make it at, at not even a micron, but you have to coat it on something. And so that is called something called Lipon. It was developed at Oak Ridge National Laboratory by the Dudney Group. Okay. And that works. And I'm told that there's millions of dollars of people who have installed the apparatus to make these films. But they're gas phase produced vacuum deposition and you can grow it, but if you imagine that you want to do hundreds of square meters, it's not going to work easily. And so the commercialization of these is a problem. Right. And remember I said that we made glues or adhesives? Yeah. We made a polymer that does the same thing. Okay. That's one of our claims to fame. Got it. Okay. And, and, and this coating, that the dendrite blocker coating that you're talking about, is uh, in some ways agnostic, whether it's a current lithium-ion liquid electrolyte. Yep, it can absolutely. Be used on that right. well. Agnostic is a lovely term. Thank you. So one of the current issues with the battery is that it needs to be at a certain temperature, 30 degrees, 35 degrees centigrade, ah, maintaining yes. it, right? And so that means from a thermal management perspective, you have, you have the battery that likes to be 35, you have the motors and the electrical stuff that needs to be around 60, 65, and then if you have an, an internal combustion engine, like assuming you're a hybrid or a plug-in hybrid, the engine needs to be around 90, 95, so you have multiple stuff. But if, if we were to just even talk about an EV, electric vehicle, you have the, the, the motors and the, the, the charging stuff that, that needs to be around 60, and then the battery wants to be around 30. Actually, some batteries only operate close to 60. Okay. All right. The, but the current lithium-ion batteries, the design that, that is in, in the cars today, need to be at 30 to 35 Yeah, and degrees. that's why they have air conditioning. Right. Yes. Right, exactly. Or peripherals, as they're called. <clears throat> and the answer is that, of course, with solid-state batteries, you don't need per, 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 <laughs> peripherals. Okay. And so that is an advantage. That means that you don't need to control or air condition your battery. Okay. So, so that means the energy density of the battery pack is higher. And you're not pushing around that mass when you drive your car. Oh, let me dig into that. So, so the energy density is higher because you've taken away the cooling plates? You're taking away the mass that doesn't count as energy. Right. Okay. What, what temperatures are we talking about? Well, there, so without naming names, there are battery companies, some of which are now defunct, that used polymer electrolytes, and the polymer electrolytes were based on polyethylene oxide. There are actually many, many papers on polyethylene oxide because it's cheap, it's something you would find in hand cream, so it's very innocuous and it's available in high purity everywhere. Mm -hmm. And that material is pretty good as a lithium ion conductor, as a solid electrolyte, but it works best near its melting point, which is 65. Seems good so far. Well, it is and it isn't because you, one of the things that you have to recognize is that our vehicles have to operate in Minnesota in the dead of winter yeah, and in Arizona in the height of summer. Right. And so you can't allow for the changes in the temperatures to control how well you can drive. Right. And so you are you have to be isolated in terms of temperatures. I could have mentioned Manitoba, okay, but this is, might as well talk about it. I, I, I lived in Minnesota. I know the exact temperature. Yeah. All right. So it's cold. So you have to be, you don't want to have to heat a battery up to get it to work well. Right. All right. And so that means that the battery you use to start your vehicle in the morning in Minnesota still has to work at minus 30, let's say. Right. Okay unless you live in a heated garage, with a heated garage. And the, the same issue is true in Arizona where it's 110. You want it to still operate when it's well above the melting temperature of your electrolyte. Right. So those are, you have to have it insulated, and those are concerns that are not battery concerns in the sense that they are insulation concerns. Got it. They're thermal management, which you're the expert. So 
the the current electrolyte that we use is mostly because of the temperature operation range the, from the negative right. 30 40 to yes to positive 30 40. 140 150 yeah. or whatever oh well centigrade i think we're talking about oh uh, right right yeah, okay right. so yeah the answer is correct and there's other issues with that that you can envision if you get a leak of liquid electrolyte it's going to have a flash point and those are concerns for people mm -hmm. and how flammable it is. So people put in things that cause it to be less flammable. The presence of lithium ion salts also reduces flammability. And uh, lithium ion salts are not flammable themselves. It's the lithium metal that's flammable. Right. Okay. So how far the timeline, so if, 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 if I was an investor and I would say, oh, I, I like everything I hear about this thing. Okay. Can we get a, can we get a working prototype uh, for do batteries? I in, do I get in trouble if I mention names? You won't, but <laughs> we, can, we can cut it out. If you, so yeah. there's at least one company that had a video portrayal of their technology. Okay. And um, they claimed to have certain things that worked. <clears throat> and after the video presentation, their stock doubled in price, maybe okay. even more. And about two days later, it went, it tanked again. Okay. And then they're now the subject of lawsuits because they hid certain things. Mm -hmm. And so one has to be very careful. The future is still defined by how careful one can engineer interfaces. And so there's a few things out there that seem like they'll They'll happen, but I just mentioned $130 million to solid power. They have what is called a 22-layer cell, mm -hmm. which is a good start. And presumably it works at room temperature because originally their materials worked only at 100 degrees. Mm -hmm. And because they are in Colorado, the argument was that they're going to use them to power logging devices for oil wells where the temperature downhole is 100 degrees. So it could work, but I, either they have solved this problem or they're working with the idea that they're keeping their batteries warmer than what we know. Okay. Right. So I can't say because I don't know, but I would imagine they've come to some reduction in their operating temperatures. There's another company called Sila and they have, a, they're quite secret and they have hundreds of millions of dollars in investment by large auto oil companies. No one has seen a product. Or if they have, their, the samples they're sent to automotive companies are not being discussed openly. Right. So, but from a material science and manufacturing perspective, it's more the manufacturing at scale that is yes. the key puzzle well, that needs to be solved. Well, th there's a question that we're going to have to face really soon, and there are already companies that are addressing it, is how do we recycle? Yeah. Okay. And so that... As soon as you, uh, many of you will be aware that cobalt is a bad actor. It's uh, geopolitically unsound to invest in things that need cobalt. And the next thing that goes in that direction is lithium and nickel. Mm -hmm. And lithium, maybe you're all aware that people are starting to mine lithium where it wasn't very economical to do so because now we're um, suffering from the potential to be strangled by the sources of lithium because that are... Because China is the largest... Well, uh, South America also has a very large footprint in this area. Okay. okay, but there's places in the United States where people are starting to... I have a friend who has a solution on how to remove it from seawater, but it hasn't been implemented. It's just an idea, okay, because the concentration in seawater is very, very low. Okay. Got it. So recycle is very in. One of the things that we haven't addressed is one that you were going to ask me anyway, what are the next generation batteries? Yeah, so okay. that, that's, if I were to go, you know, time travel, 2035, open an EV and look at, look I, at what the I battery I think you don't have like. to go that far in advance. So, of course, the Nobel Prize given in 2020 was for lithium ion battery work, and there were three inventors, one of whom is a professor in New York, Stan Winningham, and Stan has verbally stated the following several times. I've heard him speak. The next generation battery is likely to be lithium sulfur, unfortunately. Yeah. He used the word unfortunately. Okay. Because of sulfur being the bad actor. No, this, in this case, 
yes, you might make lithium hydrogen sulfide. It's not the same as metal sulfides, okay, that are okay. used. But lithium, <clears throat> if you look at, I, I can also just discuss what Sila is supposedly doing is using silicon. All right, I'll come back to silicon in just a second. Yeah. All right, so I mentioned in the beginning of this podcast that graphite has a capacity of about 370 milliamp hours per gram. And by comparison, lithium sulfur is 1,600. Wow. Okay. Now, just to throw something else out, silicon is 4,700 about, roughly, milliamp hours. So okay. it's more than 12 times graphite. Right. Why aren't we using it immediately? That was going to be my question. It's obvious. No, it's not obvious. All right. It's not, so remember, not I kept mentioning that uh, there's going to be a change in the volume as you absorb or desorb lithium. Right. So silicon, when it lithiates, changes in volume by almost 400%. So you take a little ball of silicon and you lithiate it and it becomes a big ball. Well, right. how do I contain that and keep the energy density? And I have to imagine I have this bellows-like behavior, it fragments and it destroys contacts with the electrodes and it falls apart. So the solution has been to make very small particles of silicon and encapsulate them to prevent that expansion. That doesn't work so well because we're not seeing anything that's So you're there. talking about tiny little bubbles that yeah. expand you know, yes, right. 10 times as much and comes down. So now... In contrast, sulfur expands maybe 60 to 70 percent. So that's you, still high. So we're we're still talking well, flexible well, there's, well, batteries. Well, there, here's the here's the objective is to contain it by building some sort of steel ball that doesn't allow it to expand, but does allow it to pick up lithium. And the answer is, of course, then you have a steel ball manufacturing problem. Right. So you you have to figure out how to do that. Some of the work with silicon encapsulates it in carbon. And in fact, people have argued that you can encapsulate it in silicon carbide, which is a very hard particle. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't, it is unreactive. Silicon carbide is unreactive. However, something that my group will talk about in the very near future is that we found, and it's reported in the literature, but not with very thin films, silicon carbide also works as an anode material, not as well as silicon, but but certainly as well as lithium sulfur. So the expansion is very much different. So lithium sulfur, if you can allow for a little bit of porosity, mm -hmm. then that looks like it should work. You have to remember, sulfur is everywhere. It's very, very effective if it is... I said the theory is 1670. If it is only 1200, it can be three times graphite. Right. So that means if you allow for the volume change, you might be able to make a lithium sulfur battery. Right. There are, like everything else in this world, what be careful what you wish for, you may get it. The problem with lithium sulfur is that it has its own separate problems. That's that have the, to be solved. That's what, and, and what are they? So that's where the unfortunately comment comes from. Yes. So it turns out that sulfur, as all of you can recognize, is insulating. It doesn't conduct electrons. Right. So how do I get the electrons out of the sulfur when I'm uh, discharging it? And then how do I get them back in later? So I have to add some carbon to conduct or something like that. Right. Also... At, when it's fully reacted, you make lithium sulfide, Li2S, which is insulating also. So how do I get it? And then there's a problem that the intermediate, so sulfur is a cyclic molecule S8, and as it unravels to form lithium sulfide, you get chains of lithium sulfur, or called polysulfides. Those move through liquid electrolytes, mm -hmm. and they clog things up and they go to the cathode where they're not wanted, and then they deposit and they say, I'm so happy here, I'm not moving back. Ah. So you basically use up sulfur, it forms a dead layer, it's not conducting, and so the 
It's called a polysulfide shuttle. It sounds like a dance, right? Well, okay. That sounds like a one-way battery to me. So, like a one-time so this charge is battery. this is what people. So again, thousands of man years go in. People are looking for solutions. There are solutions. Mm -hmm. Okay, some of them are nearer and some of them are farther. But remember that every, we our environment is set to deal with sulfur. Mm -hmm. Okay, so recycle shouldn't be a problem. Right. So in essence. Some of the recycle issues that we would have with current lithium ion batteries, we will not have with lithium sulfur. Better yet, would be lithium oxygen. It has yeah. even double the energy density. Remember that uh, oxygen is lower, half the molecular weight of sulfur. Right. But then you have to oxygenate lithium and deoxygenate lithium, and that's a very serious problem. Uh, and also that's also higher fire probably yeah well I don't, uh, there are very few people who are I, I i shouldn't say that there are probably many people working on it but they're not saying much right okay either because it doesn't work very well or because it works too well we won't know for a while right given how how much we're all moving towards evs and the and and using the batteries it seems like Battery recycling is probably one of the next big areas. Are, Already, are, are, are doing. Yeah, could you talk a little bit about how how we are recycling them, if we are recycling them, and okay, I can talk a little bit about that. I would say that I'm far from being an expert. Okay, so in lithium-ion batteries, of course, you want to recover the lithium. You want to recover the cathode material, which is typically a, the most expensive part. Okay, mm -hmm. and so you're going to have to grind up the battery. Okay, okay. you're going to have to separate the lithium out. Lithium can be ex all of the extraction methods that are used for lithium will work in recycle. It is the metals, the transition metals, the nickels, the cobalts, the uh, titanium, whatever else is in there, that is a problem. So you have to dissolve them, and then you have to purify them or learn to use them in combination again. Um, in my group, we have found that some of these materials will dissolve in aqua regia. Well, aqua regia is not much fun to work with. Okay. So the question is... What, what, what is it? It's a mixture of hydrochloric acid and nitric acid. Oh, okay. Okay. And you, you, you've heard of it, aqua regia. Why aqua regia? Because it dissolves gold. Oh. Okay. Okay, got it. I had not asked... That question before now. I now I'm connecting the dots. <laughs> okay. You get yet you get extra for this. You didn't know <laughs> <Absolutely>. that. <laughs> I love I love those tidbits. So uh, from a recycling perspective, are we are we recycling all the batteries already? The things uh, to I, solve. I am not familiar with that. I know there are companies set up. I can tell you that right now, recycling of lead acid batteries is big business. Mm -hmm. Okay, so presumably that is going to happen. With lithium ion as well, and it, and one can imagine that the very big companies that make batteries are already working very very heavily in this area, right? Because of course for them, if they can recover the metals, the cost of the batteries they make is reduced by what they can recycle. So, right, absolutely. Let's talk about battery architecture. So you know there are a number of different designs. There's the pouch cell design, there's a cylindrical design, or perhaps other types of designs where, you know, depending on what the application is. How is the solid state uh, battery changing or impacting what the battery architecture is going to be? I can give you some discussion on that, but it will be limited because no one has made enough solid state batteries that I'm aware of mm -hmm. to tell you about the architecture of a multiple cell battery. Okay. I would argue that, all right, so everyone is familiar with the cylindrical cells because you use them in, in flashlights, you use them here and there, right. and, and you also are familiar with these pills that are used in hearing aids or some cell phone, not cell phone, flashlights yeah. also. But also Tesla's initial uh, batteries were uh, Tesla, stacked cylindrical cells. They're still stacked cylindrical right. cells. So you may have seen Elon Musk's presentation of a new kind of cell that they developed, which is what's called a tabless cell. And that really is one in which the cylinders, 
it's like a jelly roll, okay? Yeah, exactly. And the jelly roll that they developed takes the electrodes, the top and the bottom, and they basically flatten them and they form all, all form one electrode and that saves metal yeah. and it saves connection time. And one of the issues which you we sort of talked about is if you do the cylindrical, you can cool it better than if you make plates unless you put the plates on something that sucks heat out. Mm -hmm. uh, Romeo, and, and, Romeo and Power is designed a liquid electrolyte, no, a liquid that is used as a liquid coolant. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if they're actually producing it, but I know that they, I've seen the designs, okay. So that or the prismatic cells are basically cells that are, look like a lithium, I'm sorry, a lead acid battery is plates, right? And so the plates are stacked and of course the denser you stack them, the more energy you get. And so those are easier to manufacture and those also are related to pouch cells. The difference between a pouch cell and a prismatic is you, in a prismatic you just have separate cells and in a pouch cell, you can actually bend the cells like this and you make, you combine them. <clears throat> That's a simplistic presentation, but pouch cells are what power a lot of our computers now. So the pouch cells may be in some batteries for some electric vehicles. This I'm not familiar with. Right. Okay. So looking at where we're headed for lithium sulfur uh, batteries, pouch cell seems like a very, uh, obvious choice given the expansion that they would have? Well, again, the ability to allow for the expansion or to prevent it because in our, in our group, we actually bind the sulfur to carbon and it seems to limit the expansion. Okay. Right? And that's something that we've worked with a group in Germany on. And so we've been using their material, but we now have the, our own material. And those that works and gives us pretty nice energy densities and with pretty stable materials. I'm not sure how stable yet be, because they have yet to fail, but that's a right. good sign. Okay. Right. Okay. All right. So, yeah, I think that if you can immobilize the sulfur, then when you mobilize... So, ladies and gentlemen, the sulfur will bond to carbon, okay? And so... Remember I talked about the polysulfide shuttle. Right. Imagine the bottom of the seafloor and you have seaweed with fronds waving and the lithium is, the fronds are now sulfur, small sulfur chains and the lithium is skipping across the top of the chain. Yeah. If that's the case then you don't get a volume change and you don't get polysulfide shuttle. And so that is a potential solution. And there's more to that which is more technical but the creating this kind of a seaweed format on carbon is a potential solution. Okay. Fantastic. That was a lovely conversation. And thank you so much for talking with me on solid state batteries. Is there a nuance that you want people to know? <laughs> I would say that if you're going to invest, be very careful. In solid state batteries? Oh, in any, any of the lithium battery startups. Some of them are very good. Some of them are selling things they don't have. This is true of all startups, so I shouldn't be, shouldn't, I would just say be careful, okay? That's my uh, parting comments. Fantastic. And that's one of the goals for our conversation is to get a deep, nuanced conversation about the subject from subject matter experts like you so that we're all much more informed uh, about the nuances that are out there. It's fun to have had the chance to talk. Cool. Thank you so much for talking with me, Rick. Yep.